Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Gail and Chris on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes, and that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Do you have a need for legal counsel for your foreclosure, forfeiture, or eviction in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, or Illinois? Do you have an account in bankruptcy in those states and need to discuss the matter and your options? How about an account that goes into bankruptcy in any of the 94 bankruptcy jurisdictions? The attorneys and staff at Sotili and Barilli are here to assist you with those matters and more. Head on over to our Facebook page or our website at www.sotiliambarilli.com to find out more and to reach out to our team. When legal default experience matters, choose the team at Sotili and Barilli. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Gail Anthony Greenberg, here with the lovely and talented Christopher Seveny. Hey, Gail. Thank you for those kind words. How are you today? (laughs) Very good. Very good. I was actually just trying to think of what just happened, and my mind has gone blank. So why don't you tell us what just happened? So the last episode, I've had the borrower who showed up in court with a $6,000 check for reinstatement. And the only two times he's made payments to me is in court. So that's one thing that what just happened. And the other that I'll just throw out there is I am a systems guy and like my systems. And I'm in the process now of upgrading software that I'm using for managing all my assets and stuff. And I was on the phone with one of our favorites over at Madison, Shante Duffy, and just discussing the best way to get some of that information from her and just learning a little bit about more what's going on in the note world and the pulse. So one thing I'll just mention is kind of as part of what's just going on is it's always good to just stay in touch and in tune with others in the industry to hear what's going on. Because when you're living in your own little bubble, like I do, sometimes you don't get to know all of uh, what's going on in the industry. Okay. So We just need to confess right now that we're both massive gossips and we love just hearing stories from people. (laughs) So if anyone's got a good tidbit, by all means, give us a call. We're always up for that. So what just happened with you, Gail? Later on in this episode, we're going to do a lot of complaining about a certain group of people. But bottom line for me is after a two-year slog, literally, I feel like I walked was on a rental property in my own state of Pennsylvania. It was an incredibly difficult situation, took forever. I now am awaiting the sheriff's deed because this thing went to foreclosure and got no bids. And it's uh, a little row house in a little enclave of 12 little row houses in a hot rental area, like a hot Section 8 rental area. And like, I don't even have the deed yet but I contacted everyone who owns one of these other little houses in the strip to see if anybody wants to buy it. And I just got a call back from the person who owns the house next door. So Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful and excited. I just have to find out how many of these stupid liens on this thing got voided in the foreclosure and how many I'm still stuck with. (laughs) <laughs> to see like I'm hoping to break even and maybe make a few thousand dollars <laughs> but I'd be satisfied to break even at this point and lessons learned well it's always one thing after another in this business and there's always a curveballs and new things that are thrown at you and stuff and this business is not easy as it is but when you have also sometimes your consultants slash vendors making life more difficult for you that just can add to some of the frustration and I think today's episode is yeah I'm not getting philosophical about this there is someone to blame and I am naming names in this episode and this episode is about our total rage and indignation at bad attorneys in this business holy cow (laughs) <laughs> yes, and notice we said bad. There are yes. good attorneys. There, there are, are many good, good ones. Yes. We have ones we love that we're trying to think of a great baby gift for right now. 
But, oh, the ones that are not good, they are so bad. Are they not, Chris? Let me just dive right into this. They're like, the whole entire reason that I own this, or I'm about to own this rental in Norristown, PA, is that my attorney, basically the total unpaid balance that was owed to me on this house was in the area of like $77,000. And I had been saying to the attorney all along, like, when do we set the minimum bid? How do we set the minimum bid? Who do we tell what the minimum bid is? Because I'm willing to accept way less than the minimum bid. This house, if it was in perfect condition, and it's not, would be worth 60. Mm -hmm. So what are the chances that in the wrecked condition it's in right now, someone's going to pay 77 for it? So this guy kept assuring me, and I don't know what the timetable is, like, okay, the sale is coming up. We'll have a chance to let the sheriff know what the bid is. You can change the bid up until the sale starts. Well, that might be true, but everybody who's in there ready to bid does their research way before the sale starts. So changing the bid and lowering it to like a reasonable amount, which is what we did, a day or two before the sale. I think we did it the day before the sale. It's totally pointless because these people start with massive lists and they do research for like several weeks. They're not in there waiting to see what mine is going to get marked down to. You know, it was just like the stupidest thing. And this attorney, I blame myself because, well, when I bought this asset, I was like a little baby note investor. I did not know anything. And when I asked a Pittsburgh attorney to work on it, to do the foreclosure for me, he referred me to someone who was apparently his buddy in Philadelphia, not because that person was particularly skilled or experienced in doing foreclosures. And I should have known that because when I would ask him questions, he would be like, let me find out for you. Really simple questions about doing a foreclosure he'd be like yeah i'd be like well what which of these liens am i gonna have to pay if i get the house back you know let me ask you let me find out for you the guy was a divorce attorney yeah (laughs) (laughs) well i am trying to get a divorce from this borrower so that should have worked but yeah it is just the wrong attorney can just cause such bad disastrous results i just cannot I'm so indignant. I'm not sure if I'm mad at him or myself or, you know, like I said, I was a baby. I didn't know what I was doing, but I should have kind of figured it out along the line. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I always find a way to kind of sort of be annoyed at myself about something. So that's it. Well, at least your attorney would actually get back to you. I've had this 18 month venture on two condos in Florida that took twice as long as they should have basically cost twice as much as what I was told and specifically said, hey, look, do not, whatever you do, have the sales on the same date. Let's separate them by, you know. Going at the same time. Yeah, because they're literally like a few doors down from each other. And if there were two people interested, they would be like, okay, I'm a bit against each other. Of course, even though I made all those comments, they still had them the same day. One of them actually sold, the other one didn't. But then I'm like, okay, what's going on to one that sold? He's like, oh, let me look into it. And of course, the buyer did not fulfill the final sale. So basically, we wasted three weeks there to then get a new scheduled date. And on the one that I foreclosed on, and we can touch more into detail, there's actually three HOAs. And this has really been thrown for a curveball because in Florida, there's Safe Harbor where you pay. 1% of what the original mortgage the borrower had was. Now, the question is, is that per HOA or is that per overall total? And Okay, I think you you need to explain that a little more for people who don't know about Safe Harbor, HOA liens. Yeah, so in certain instances, so the HOA payment, let's say, is $300 a month. Well, the person hasn't paid in seven years, so the (laughs) HOA payment would be like $22,000. In some states, HOA liens get wiped out and others, they take priority. Yeah. In Florida, what they have is what's called safe harbor, which at least it wipes out 
the lien with the exception of, and, and again, this is in most instances, you pay 1% of the original mortgage amount or one year of HOA fees, whichever is lower. Nice. So, so in this instance, you know, the mortgage was basically, it was like 35000 So 1% is $350. So, <laughs> but the question is, is that 350 to each, all three or 350 and let the three of them fight about it? Right. So I've got the HOA attorneys calling me and I'm like, call the attorney. And they're like, your attorney doesn't respond. And I'm like, go figure. He doesn't respond to me either. So don't feel bad. And I'm the one paying him paid him over $15,000 between the two foreclosures. So I finally like emails me. I'm like, you need to call me. And actually prior to that, I asked him the question and I posted on Facebook and like the hieroglyphics that he wrote was, I mean, I'm not sure if he was drunk when he responded, but it just made completely no sense. So I'm like, call me. So finally on Thursday, doesn't call Friday, doesn't call Monday. I title an email. I'm not paying my bill. That's a good subject line. Yes, Call because if you want someone to call you. <laughs> yeah, this attorney literally will only email you with a response if there is a bill attached. And, there you go. and it's hilarious. And I made the comment in the email, basically like, I know money's involved, so you're absolutely going to reply. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, you're fired. And not so nice words. And he replies back, there's nothing left to do. And I'm like, oh, no, there is. But even if there isn't, you haven't done anything anyways, so you're still fired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just want to take a moment for everyone who now must go into mourning over the fact that they thought you were so nice all the time, and now they find out, like, when the fangs come out on Chris Seventy. <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> Back up. ...type of individual where I'm very friendly, courteous, and helpful, but when it's basically becomes to the point of negligence or lying to me. Yeah. It's kind of like I just bring out the Sherman tank and just start firing. There's, no, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing no in, in between. between and yeah, it's, it's like a fault sweet. of mine, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. A switch flips. Yeah, that switch flips and it's literally <laughs> like pressing the red button, the yeah. launch. Noted. It's frustrating because I'm trying to get something answered. I'm trying to get something resolved. It's sucking yeah. up all my time. And the response I got was like, sorry, I'm dealing with like moving or something else. And so you know, it was like the most, I mean, the response was just so pathetic. I just want to say when people bring personal stuff into it, unless they're really ill or a close family member is really ill mm -hmm. or there's like some kind of family emergency. Like when people are just like, oh, I'm moving. I'm just like, things aren't really taken care of at work because I'm moving. <laughs> really? You should, yeah. you should plan better for these yeah, anticipated that's, moves. That's why you have staff. You know? <laughs> that's why there are movers and yeah. other people who, yeah, I mean, this is a guy's a very high powered attorney. And I said we were going to name names. I apologize. We're not naming names, but anyone who is a member of our Notes and Bolts Facebook group knows that there is a crowdsourced good and bad attorneys list on there, and you will find every one of the people that we're talking about <laughs> on that list. So woe well unto you and if you ignore it. It's funny because I've had two problems with attorneys, one in Pennsylvania, one in Florida, and I've only fired an attorney in Pennsylvania and Florida. And the interesting thing is, it's the same attorney. <laughs> I actually am also using that attorney in Pennsylvania and feel like I have to because the collateral is a little wonky on this note, but he was the one who assured the previous owner that it could be foreclosed on. And he gave me a written guarantee that it could be foreclosed on. So there's like a missing note and, you know, there's just stuff. Like it that may one. be foreclosed on, but will it be done in your lifetime? A. Yeah. And will it be done at under $20,000 B? So those are two things that probably aren't in the guarantee. Yeah. And what I would tell you, is <laughs> I would send it over either like a Mike Mazak at his new firm or his oh. old firm and say, hey, can you just look at this and give me your opinion? Because what's his guarantee that? <laughs> no, you're right. Well, we're in pretty deep. The sale is coming up. So 
and I'm hoping we're going to get to the finish line anyway. But speaking of the naughty list of attorneys on our Facebook page, Notes and Bolts, from the Good Deeds Note and Investing Podcast, <laughs> there is another one that we shared. It's amazing how we have, by some kind of horrible irony, gravitated and hired the same awful attorneys, because you and I have one down south also. I'm not going to use the word celebrated my first anniversary doing a forfeiture in Georgia. Yes, it's been a year since I hired this person to do it. So celebrate is not the right word. I've marked like a solemn occasion my first year anniversary on this forfeiture. We still don't have the papers in hand. We are waiting for the judge to make a decision. And I just don't even know how to express. Like, the one thing that I know went horribly wrong on this was that there was a three-month period where supposedly he had given the original service documents to the sheriff to serve. I don't even remember if it was which stage we were at. It was very early on. And he just forgot to send them. And me being an idiot about it and not like riding him like a wild Mustang, you know, I didn't check back enough. (laughs) And a few months went by and it was so appalling that I demanded that he give us half our money back. And he did because he knows how bad he is. It's interesting because the attorney I use in Georgia has always told me, don't buy contract for deeds in Georgia because they can get pretty squirrely. You just mentioned a one-year time frame. The one foreclosure I did in Georgia, I believe we sent the demand letter on November 30th and the foreclosure sale was held on February 1st. Not 15 (laughs) months later, three months later. (laughs) So So first of all, thing to remember about the law, Mm -hmm. just like medicine accounting and everything else is like there is a little bit of art it looks cut and dried you know there are laws but there is like some area in which their strategic ability and just wisdom and stuff like really affects what happens like it isn't just a bunch of people just following prescribed steps everyone does it the same way somebody who We knew kind of at the beginning that this borrower who didn't even live in the house, it was a rental, which in my mind should have made it like so much faster. I mean, it should have in some respects been easier and faster because we were not putting someone out of their home, didn't have that kind of gravitas to it. And yet it was like a massive getting tied up in your underwear kind of situation. And even after we got the sheriff to do what he was, you know, he couldn't find the borrower and it led to like months of sort of, how do we find her? Where do we find her? What do we do? It was just like so stupid. Like I want someone who really knows what they're doing and like has a strategy for how he does it. Like, okay, we try for a month to send the sheriff to the address we think. That doesn't work. We immediately go to this. Like some people who don't do these things all the time, they just flop around like fish on a dock. And it's just pathetic to watch and really aggravating to experience. And that's a challenge. And this is where I'd say people can't train you about soft skills in this business is there's times when people get too aggressive with their attorney, thinking that their attorney is going to basically be doing backflips and getting things out that day for them. And then there's things where everything just sits and there's that kind of happy medium and fine line. And that's where I always like to have the conversation up front and constantly throughout like, okay, what are the next steps? What are the next steps? And just get an understanding and okay, what's the timing on that? So you constantly get updated. So there's no misunderstanding. Then when someone says, okay, we'll send this out by July 1st, you know, on July 3rd, I'll reach out and say, Hey, I want to confirm this one out. Please forward me a copy of it or whatnot. Yeah. If they didn't usually you know, the next day they may send it. It might be dated July 3rd or what it is. And then, okay, you got it. Or if you don't hear from them, you know, it's just, I constantly stay on them and say, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? Yeah. I ask them now to copy me on everything they like send. Like when they send a demand letter, I want you at the same time, 
it's going out the door. I want you to email it to me. Yep. So that the thing is you have to try to create, there is no accountability structure mm-hmm. in these individual relationships that we have with people doing work for us, but you have to kind of create one yep. right from the get go or, and I think they function better. A lot of people should not be in situations where all the time management things are up to them and they're not on a machine in a factory making a certain part and they're accountable for so many per hour or whatever. They're just kind of in their offices, kind of daydreaming. And it's very helpful to create structure for people like that because then they kind of rise to their kind of highest level of efficiency too. Some people, you still have to drag them like lifeless bodies behind you as you're going through the process. <laughs> it's one thing too that I've noticed in one of them with the attorney who I terminated versus another attorney I use. And I'll send them saying, hey, want to confirm this one out? And you know, one of them will be like, hey, look, I didn't get to it. I'll get it out tomorrow and I'll send you a copy, whatnot and so forth. The other one's like, yeah, that went out on Friday. And then like most of these records are public record. And then you'll go online and like look at, see it and stuff. And like three weeks later, it finally pops up online. And it was dated like three days after the conversation you had with somebody. Right. So how could they send it and date it you know, a week prior to when it was sent? I'm like, why are you lying to me? Yeah, I That's- think there's quite a bit of lying that goes like ass covering type lying yep. that goes on in this business. Yeah. So tell us how hard is it to switch an attorney? I am in the process of, and it's funny actually, because this attorney hasn't responded to actually sign the document that needs to be responded, which is of course not surprising. Plus they actually owe me money because in the middle of May or the end of May, they got the funds from the deposit from the guy who was going to buy it at foreclosure who didn't. So they've been sitting on my money for almost two months now. So they need to send me the money, as well as sign the document, which I sent to them this morning. And it is called a stipulation of substitution of counsel. And it is a one page document, which has about 30 words in it basically says, I'm substituting myself for your firm in regards to this matter, and just requires their signature. And nothing more, very simple. And I am, again, still waiting for that to be signed. So I sent, again, the email this morning, but hopefully I'll get something back this week. I still got a few weeks before the actual foreclosure sale. Oh, boy. Okay, good luck with that. Exactly. I think we all want to hear his reply when it comes in. Yeah, I won't even get into some of his replies that he sent me, but that's a whole nother. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to communication with any of your vendors and stuff. And we mentioned you know, a minute ago about like kind of the, you know, something isn't done, just tell something. Hey, I didn't get to it. I mean, that's why I'll tell people, hey, I didn't get to it or I'm trying to get to it. Not tell me that you sent something out and all of a sudden it's not done because it makes you look like an idiot because you'll go to an investor and say, oh yeah, this is done and it's going to happen. And then it doesn't or something gets delayed and stuff and it just makes you look like you're being dishonest as well. Okay. So I'm just trying to think if there's any more attorneys in my life that need to be pilloried in this particular podcast. I think I'm pretty happy with everybody else. How about you? You and I have a lot of overlap in who we use and pretty similar experiences. It's funny because we both know when someone's having an off period, (laughs) and we'll be like, what do you think about so-and-so? Like nothing's happening over there. He's definitely got something going on. So that's very helpful. (laughs) So the only other one that drives me nuts, and this isn't with any specific attorney, is when they send you like the invoice, like literally like two months later. And I've had one where we sold a property and we took it back and like sold it to somebody in like January. And then in March, I get like an invoice and I'm like, great, I've already closed out my JV and everything. And now that's the other one that drives me nuts is it's like, bill, please, on a monthly basis. And I actually modified a few things in regards to close out on some things in that fashion, just because of issues that have occurred like that. But you know, that's the other one. But right now, no, I've got attorneys right now. I've got one in Montana I'm working with right now, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Michigan, Virginia, North Carolina, Ohio. Boy, are you litigious. 
No, I'm yeah. actually, no. The one in North Carolina <laughs> is in regards to a cash for keys where they couldn't find the borrower. So we have to go through the courts and I'm also using them because I'm creating a new land contract in North Carolina. So that's that component. Ohio, I'm going through a foreclosure and a forfeiture where one is the borrower passed away and the other one, the borrower went on a very long vacation. A dream vacation. Dream vacation. <laughs> uh, I hope he at least sent you a postcard. Montana, same thing. The borrower has passed away, so just we have to go through mm. the legal process there. Virginia, it's basically that one. I'm not sure why that one's challenging. It's the person's got a renter in there, and they've had it as a rental for the last few years. Now I'm not sure why they're not deciding to pay, but I find that's very common that someone has a renter in there and they're getting paid, but they're just not paying you. And I'm not sure, like, I mean, if it's a good deal, like, obviously it's a great deal when you're getting rent money and you're not paying your mortgage, but it's a good deal when you are paying your mortgage. Like, why don't you just pay your mortgage and keep it long term rather than just waiting Mm -hmm. for the boom to drop, you know, and lose the house and lose the rent. Pennsylvania, I just finished, wrapped up a cash for keys agreement that they handed off the keys yesterday for. So that's you know another one. So been busy in regards to a lot of stuff uh, going on with attorneys. So you got to always work with them and keep them on your good side. But you just also want to make sure you're working with a good attorney. Okay. So here's a question for you. We revealed recently that you don't actually have to have an attorney to send your demand letter. Yes. But since most of our demand letters come from attorneys that we use, like, okay, you have an attorney, they've done demand letters for you. Now you want to send one to a borrower in the same state. Mm -hmm. And you basically want to use the letter that the attorney did for you before. (laughs) You can't really do that, can you? Because if you then get no result from the demand letter and you're going to have to go back to that attorney who wrote the original demand letter that you reused, to do the rest of the thing. They're going to see that you use their When you say, well, let me clarify. When you say reuse, do you mean just copy and paste the text or do you mean like use their letterhead and everything? Because one is... Oh, no, no. Just like their text. (laughs) Yeah. Just put in the new information in their (laughs) template. I think that is a discussion that you should absolutely have with the attorney that you're going to use for the foreclosure. Uh, (laughs) Who are stealing their demand letter. (laughs) Well, I mean, demand letters, I mean, some have state specific things that need to be included in them and others really just have to say certain things. And I'll say like, they're not a forbidden secret type document. It's usually you get more teeth from it from an attorney. But you talk to the attorney and say, hey, look, I'm going to send my own demand letters and stuff like that. And you have an issue with it. And they say, no, go ahead. Yeah, but if you said to them, I'm going to take your demand letter and put the new information in it and send that. Well, I wouldn't like, plagiarize hey. the letter. I would have, <laughs> honestly, what that's I would, what I was getting to. Yeah, I would yeah. have my attorney, one of my other attorneys, take a look at it and probably just tweak some of the language in it just to make sure or add even maybe a little more information into it, possibly. Well, um, at that point, if you're having another attorney like review it and everything, you probably you might as well just go to the original attorney and let them send it. I mean, so... If you're doing a lot, you can have an attorney review it for 150 yeah. bucks, but if you're yeah. sending it to a borrower or co-borrower, there's 200 bucks. So it's... Yes. Yeah. So some demand letters, like I find in the Midwest, like you can get them for 100 bucks. Down South, I paid 250 And like I once paid 450 And this is really aggravating. So I had an attorney... This is an attorney that I actually like because even though they messed up, they redeemed themselves in the end. But it was a situation in a state where the way you do a demand letter is it's like a 45-day letter, it's called. You send it to the person letting them know they have 45 days instead of 30 is kind of the usual in most places, but 45 days. And if they don't reinstate fully in 45 days, the bond for deed or land contract is canceled as a matter of law. Like no other anything happens. There's no hearing. There's no judicial process. It's over. Mm -hmm. And then they have either the state mandated mandated five-day eviction period to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. Or if your land contract gives them 30 days, they have 30 days. 
the law is very specific as it is in most places. And this 45 day letter is to be sent certified return receipt requested. And of course, you normally don't get the receipt back because there isn't someone to sign there. Or if they see it and it's got the return address of a law firm, they don't sign it or whatever. You don't get the card back. Mm -hmm. But you at least have the certified slip. So these people sent it instead via UPS, which probably in terms of like the delivery receipt and stuff, it's probably even better than just having a certified letter that never gets picked up at the post office from the standpoint of fairness to the borrower. Mm -hmm. But we sent it and then like 29 days into the 45 days, I realized like, oh crap, we did not send it certified mail, return receipt request. We sent it via UPS. Like I don't want that to be the thing that undoes what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. So I pointed it out to the attorney. What do you think? Should we resend it? Yes, we should resend it. So we did. And then the person did reinstate, like after the original 45 days, like had we sent the first one correctly, their land contract would have been canceled. And I just want to say, like, I'm not like a vicious, vindictive person who's like trying to get people canceled. But this was a very special situation where the house itself was unsafe and there were small children living there. And I really just wanted them to get out of there. So I was just desperate for this to go the way it was supposed to. And when I got billed for that, they not only billed me $450 for the 45-day letter, $450, (laughs) that's really a lot. Yeah. They billed me for two of them because they sent two of them. Why did they send two of them? Because they messed it up the first time. So I'm like, okay. (laughs) <laughs> let's review what happened here. Well, we could have a whole topic on just I mean making sure to review your attorney bills because like the one who I fired charged like yeah. $175 and they're like okay we follow Fannie Mae they're like oh charge $175 to review the submission to the court I'm like why am I paying an extra $175 for that should be included or if you had somebody else do it and you're reviewing it then like that's part of the cost So this attorney, I truly think, follows like the car salesman method of billing. It's like, or the late night infomercial. They point in one direction and pick your pocket with the other hand. Well, they'll put like, they'll put all these bills or like time and hours on the thing. And then they'll cross them off and say like, courtesy, courtesy, courtesy. And I'm like, no, that's not a courtesy. That's part of the main bill already. Like, that is so funny. Yes, the gracious benefactor invoice. Yes, I could have charged you all these things, but look, I crossed them out. (laughs) Aren't I just (sighs) something else? Yes. Well, Gail. Yeah. So they're wily little ferrets. Let's just, the bad ones, they're wily little monkeys. Keep an eye on them and check your bills. I'm sorry, you were about to. (laughs) I was just going to say, I think we've complained enough about attorneys for today and. Kvetch, kvetch, kvetch. I could keep that. Well, we both could, but yes. Let's regain our dignity here and stop yeah. screeching. Yeah. If anyone's taking like a flight from one coast to the other, let us know. We'll do a five-hour podcast for you just on that, and you can listen to it the entire <laughs> flight. Most okay. people's commute is only between 20 and 40 minutes, so that's where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Cutting it off. Okay, great. Let's leave our loyal listeners with some great tips, and mine, not surprisingly, is related to this very subject. After I got in touch with the sheriff's office on my foreclosure to find out what the process was to get the sheriff's deed recorded and to find out which liens I was going to have to pay, I thought to ask the very nice staff lady in the sheriff's office, like, this attorney of mine, does he do a lot of foreclosures with you? And she's like, oh, no, I've never heard of him before. (laughs) <laughs> and I thought, bingo. Next time I do one of these, job one, call the sheriff's office and find out who does all the foreclosures in this county. Like, who are the big attorneys who get them all done? And I'm going to hire one of those guys next time. You hire them. I'm going to call them and see if they have any clients that are looking to sell before the foreclosure. <laughs> 
<laughs> that too. Let's just get to be friends with them and we'll just milk everything we can out of them. So my note in bold, this is actually a question slash uh, curious your thoughts on this too. So I've had this real quirky situation where I had a land contract in North Carolina where the person paying wasn't the actual borrower and the borrower kind of assigned it without assigning it to another woman who's been paying it and fixing the house and so forth and so on. But it's led to numerous things. But at the end of the day, they have canceled. I'm going to get this other individual who's the one that's actually been paying under a new land contract. Okay. So let's say John is your land contract borrower. John sold the property kind of on his own land contract. There's not even any paperwork. There's no paperwork and just said, here, just pay this much to the servicer. Pay okay, this much so Mary to is this now person. in the house, fixing yeah. it up like a shiny penny and has no idea that she has no actual rights to this house. Correct. Right? But she's been sending in payments to pay down the amount that the Southern yeah. owes. But what they weren't doing was paying the escrow payments. So that's where all of a sudden two years of tax payments got behind. I paid them and be like, okay, time to pay up. And that's how this all kind of came to fruition. The woman who's been living there who kind of has been basically kind of snickered by this other guy, I'm not going to, I'll say, take advantage of her and take the land contract price and make it the value of the property because she's put right. equity into it. But one of the things I am doing is I am getting a home inspection done on the property because as you've seen in the news, like a lot of people claim that they're buying these houses on land contract, not knowing like what the extent of repairs and everything are and so forth. So I'm basically have it done, share it with this individual and say, here's the inspection report. You are going to also sign off acknowledging you've seen this report. So you know, a in look. a year, if she stops paying and then claims, you know, I bought this crappy house that had all these problems I didn't know about, I will have a document that says, here's an inspection report on the property. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So we should give people like numbers to chew on because that's what we're all about. Your unpaid balance, you told me, is about 30000 and the value yep. of the house is closer to seventy five. Yep. depending on what this home inspection finds, but a yep. ton of equity in there. And this lady, mm -hmm. I mean, she's been working on the house, fair mm -hmm. play to her, but she's getting a heck of a deal. So what you said to me is like, you're not going to make a new land track with her for the actual value of the house, which is 75, but you're not going to give it to her for 30 either because you've had to pay the taxes and you've got legal costs and servicing costs and other things along the way. So you're just kind of add up everything you've got in it and mm -hmm. add that to the unpaid yeah. balance and Which, let that be it. So she's yeah. not going to be thrilled because she thinks she's got it at the original balance. She, but she doesn't know. It's a heck of a deal. She doesn't even know, honestly. Okay. Well, one, she doesn't know. <laughs> Two, she yeah. does know. She does acknowledge that the taxes weren't being paid. And the way I look at it is if this property was going to foreclose, what is the amount the lender is could recover? And that's basically what the amount is. I'm not going to take the money I've thrown out of pocket and give her, not charge her for that. Yeah. You know, no, I agree. Me, but, I think I think you're being very fair considering that the house is considerably more valuable. But we all agree this woman who is though in her 70s has been to some degree, it's not snickered. Snickers are a good thing. It's it's snookered, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure. I'm just. I don't I'm eat snickers, sir. But uh, yeah. yeah. So either way, you're so pure. Your body's I, a temple. I mean, you know, there's investors out there that would basically be like, "Sorry, I own the house now. You can be a yeah. renter. I'm not selling. Get it. out. Yeah, and get out. Yeah. Um, I know. So here's my other question: If she's in her 70s, she obviously doesn't have income. How are you going to get her qualified to be the new borrower? And if you can, can you do give her a lease option instead? So one, I'm still waiting on the paperwork for her to fill out. She's still working. She does get Social Security. And I think her son lives there because she did mention, she's like, if I don't qualify, can I get a co-borrower? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, awesome. yes, you could. And because she's <laughs> like, you know, my credit score isn't like 700. I'm like... Okay. I said, typically, I mean, your credit score, of course, will get reviewed, but we got to make sure you have the ability to repay, meaning that you know yeah. your, your payment with escrow is going to be 500 bucks a month. 
I need to make sure you can pay $500 a month. If you only make $500. Yeah. You said her credit score is not 700. Well, yeah. Well, she said, she's like, my credit score is not like it's 700. She's like, I've had credit issues uh, yeah. in the past. And I'm like, I just found out because I'm trying to get a borrower qualified that for conventional mortgages, for FHA mortgages, 580 is the minimum. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you, you don't have to have 700. <laughs> now, you've got some you lenders out there that go down to 500. The challenge is a lot of these CFDs and stuff, the property values are only, they're under 50,000. So that's really where the mitigating factor is. If somebody's got a credit score of 550 on a $100,000 house and they can afford it, they can go get a loan from somebody at 7 8%. If you have that note and it's at 10%, you could get them refinance that, refinance out of that, I think, pretty quickly. So. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This has been a great little visit with you. And let's do it again soon. Yes. And for all of you, our faithful listeners, thanks so much for joining us again. Please be sure to Sign up on our website, gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com, for first look at our fabulous tapes of notes that we put out periodically, and for any other like terrific gifts that Chris is always creating and frequently shares. Thank you all again, and go out and do some good deeds. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast with Chris Seveny and Gail Anthony Greenberg. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.